Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, this is Richard Eidlin from Business for America. Welcome to our webinar on election reform initiatives in the great state of Pennsylvania. And I'm going to turn it over in a moment to my colleague, Steve Masters. But first, I wanted to just tell everyone a little bit about Business for America. We're a national advocacy organization focused on making the business or economic case for what we would call political reform initiatives. And those are nonpartisan efforts to improve the way elections are run, administered, uh, and financed. So we have projects underway now in Pennsylvania, uh, soon to be in Wisconsin, and working also at the federal level. In Pennsylvania, we've initiated an effort to educate and mobilize business leaders uh, across the state to learn about some of the important reforms taking place in Pennsylvania. And today, we're really happy to have a number of speakers who are going to give us an update on what's been happening in the legislature and what the future looks like for election security and election reform leading to the 2020 election. So let me introduce my colleague, Steve Masters from Just Laws. Steve's located in Philadelphia and is our point person on the ground in Pennsylvania. Steve, turn it over to you. Richard, thank you so much. Uh, welcome everyone to our webinar this afternoon. So uh, let me first uh, introduce um, folks to, uh, to Senator Mike Fulmer. Um, Senator Fulmer um, is the, the um, majority chair of the State Government Committee, a committee that he has um, led for some time. Um, he, uh, I'm looking at his uh, website. And he's, his, 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 uh, his history in politics goes all the way back to the Lebanon City Council. Um, and um, he, has, uh, he has been a senator for, for quite some time now and, and has been responsible for uh, passing a lot of um, significant pieces of legislation. Um, and uh, so we're going to hear first for, uh, from, from Senator Fulmer and then um, we'll be hearing from Ariane Abney. Um, Ariane is um, the uh, Pennsylvania point person for a group called All Voting is Local. And before he joined All Voting is Local, he was a uh, program officer at a local foundation um, and uh, sits on the board of many uh, important civic um, organizations in the Pittsburgh area. Um, so, uh, Senator Fulmer, uh, we're, we're looking now, it's, it seems like for the first time in, in really decades and decades, uh, a, a, a new uh, modern uh, version of the election code is emerging through your committee and, and through many of the bills of, and legislation that you have um, sponsored. So please um, uh, let us uh, understand uh, what is the, the, the current state of election reform in, in Pennsylvania and, and what is it that you're trying to do? Well, what we're trying to do is um, basically this. Last session, um, we've had several meetings and hearings with the various uh, judges of elections from across this, the Commonwealth and also with our county commissioners on, 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 on the election code. Uh, the, our election code, for all intents and purposes, while it's been tweaked a little bit, has really been untouched for about 70 years. Um, our goal was after those hearings with the judges of elections from across the Commonwealth, uh, because after all, those folks are the ones that have to do the elections, they have to run the elections, and they do a very good job, by the way. Uh, we wanted to get their opinions. And, and what, we, we, what, we, what should we do first? Um, the first round of bills that we are attempting to get going uh, basically came out of those discussions with those judges of elections and, of course, CCAP, um, uh, which is the organization of our county commissioners across the state. Uh, the first one uh, that we're, lo we're looking at, constitutional amendment uh, for absent absentee ballots. I, I have mine, and the co-sponsor is, is Judy Schwank as the Democrat. Uh, we also are going to do a constitutional amendment on poll workers by Pat uh, Stefano and myself. Uh, the constitutional amendment for separate ballot uh, ju uh, judicial retention elections, which it seems to be a, uh, an issue for some of our judges of elections. And I just lost everybody. Oh, here we are. Um, also, uh, 
absent, another absentee ballot in tandem with, uh, uh, with, with Judy Schwank. Uh, we're also looking at permanent early voting, uh, which is another bill of mine. And then uh, uh, cur uh, voter voting ses uh, centers and curbside voting, which is Senator Killian and, and myself. Um, we're also looking at the number of votes to qualify as a write-in uh, winner. And also we're looking at a number of ballots to be printed uh, for, for elections. Um, and, and such, and also uh, the consolidation of smaller precincts. Uh, we've also looked at, uh, from, those, from that hearing that you made reference to, we talked uh, about open primary. Uh, we also, uh, uh, Senator Boscola had two bills, uh, one with a voter registration for younger uh, Pennsylvanians and, and uh, uh, Oscola's uh, elimination of the straight party t uh, uh, ticket vote. And also uh, Senator Vogel's um, the election on the election commission. So uh, that's basically what we're attempting to do. Uh, we were hoping to, uh, we're trying to make sure that we have consensus that we do this right. And uh, uh, there's where we're at right now as, as, far as, the, uh, as far as the committee goes. I kind of went through it kind of fast, but you said I had about maybe 12 minutes. So I wanted to make sure I got it done. Oh, you have a lot more time, Senator. You, you, you are very um, economical in, in your time use. You, you have 10 more minutes. So maybe you oh, could- maybe I race through it like that one. Go ahead. <laughs> and I, I put up a slide, uh, two slides of, uh, that you, your office had sent me to, so that folks can see the, the different, um, the three constitutional amendments um, that, you, uh, that you're considering and then, and then the other um, pieces of, of legislation. Um, well, maybe, maybe you could um, go into a little more depth with us about um, the basic um, like concepts and vision. How do you see the future of voting in Pennsylvania? Because a, a lot of these reforms that you're, that, you're, that you're looking at will change um, in many ways the way people will be voting. Well, what we're looking at, and, and if, if, if you would have a chance to do this. I think if you have any summaries of the various bills, if, if you could put those up, first of all, and then uh, there you go. That's good. Um, and then as, as far as where we're going to be going, here, here's what we want to do. The whole process, the, the whole reason of doing this was number one, uh, through the discussions that we've had with the judges of elections and, and others, uh, we found out that, that we are a little bit behind as far as modernizing how Pennsylvanians can vote. The goal was to take the first round, which would seem to be, I would consider them low, lower hanging fruits uh, uh, on, on addressing uh, election issues um, to, to get to, to, to be our first movement towards modernizing how Pennsylvanians can vote. For instance, the two absentee ballot votes and the early voting scenarios. Um, and and poll, uh, constitutional amendment for poll workers, um, because we're finding out from judges of elections, it's getting harder and harder to find uh, uh, poll workers, things of that nature. So the goal was to, to through the discussions and through those meetings with the judges of elections, which, which I was totally amazed that no one's ever be, <laughs> before me that they were stunned that they actually were, were being asked for their opinion on some of these issues. Uh, but it, it, as it turns out, they were, and, 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 and they been were very helpful. So that's basically that. The first round of bills that I just talked about basically came from them. And, and, and that's what we're trying to buy, build consensus. Now, one thing I did find out, though, is that now I know why no one has opened up our election code for 70 years, because in, in, in things that you would think are non-controversial, turns out to be I guess that one organization called all all voting's local or something. Well, there's an I guess there's an old saying in Pennsylvania, all politics is local, and 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 it seems like everybody had an opinion on some of the most uh, on some of the most non what I would refer to as non controversial bills. So we're we're trying to build that consensus by working with the Department of State, also trying to build consensus across the voting aisles, uh, so that because. Me personally, I do not believe any of these issues are Republican or Democrat issues. They're not red or blue issues. I always refer to them. I think I re referred to them at the hearing as a purple issue. Uh, this is a people issue. This is just 
good common sense stuff that we're trying to do to make sure that people have an, uh, a safe and secure voting system that's easier and, and more accessible for those folks. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Fulmer. So um, one of the things I was really struck by in, in watching the, the video, the three and a half hours of your hearing was, um, well, besides the, the length, which was, which, which you really gave it a lot of time. You, go, you let everyone really speak and, and put their ideas out and have them have the back and forth. But I was really struck by how, how bipartisan the conversation was. Um, and it, it seems that uh, the, the leadership, um, the Republican leadership and the Democratic leadership seem to be coming from similar places of wanting um, to, to fix problems, but, but to make it easier to, to, uh, to vote and have access to, to voting. Would you say that that's um, a shift from how it's, it's been before, or, or is, this, is this something that didn't really surprise you? Well, I'm, I don't know if, there's, if it's a shift from before. I think what is happening and, and what is, has happened in our present um, environment that we live in, political environment, there seems to be so much division and these walls that have been built up. And on issues like this, whether it's uh, voting or uh, various ethics issues and so forth, these aren't issues of, like I said earlier, and I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here to death here, but, uh, uh, or more death, but these are not uh, Republican or Democrat issues. So in a sense, for me, myself personally, no, I'm not surprised because they shouldn't be. And the goal as the majority chair of the committee is to go through, have, his, have, have reform, build the biggest consensus that we can, and there's gonna be folks that aren't gonna be totally happy here as we move forward, but we don't wanna sacrifice good for perfection. Great. Um, so, Senator, I'm going to bookmark you right now, um, turn it over to Arianne for, for a few minutes, and then, and then we'll have a conversation with you um, back and forth, and then we'll have some, some questions from, from folks. So thank you so much. Um, Arianne, um, help us understand what these proposals, uh, the context um, for these election reform proposals um, compared to other states that, that your organization, your national organization is, is working with or, or you know, has, has experience with? Sure, so first and foremost, thank you, Steve. Um, thank you, Sarah and Rich and um, all those associated with Business for America. Um, thank you for having me here today to be participatory on this webinar. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, to all those who are on the call, um, good afternoon. Um, as Steve mentioned, my name is Arian Abney and I'm currently the Pennsylvania State Director for All Voting is Local. It is a nonpartisan initiative that fights to eliminate some of the needless and discriminatory um, barriers to voting that, you know, before they happen, um, and to build a democracy that works for us all. Um, it is an initiative uh, and a campaign that's housed out of the Leadership Conference Education Fund, and it works in conjunction with the ACLU Foundation, uh, American Constitution Society, uh, Campaign Legal Center and Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. Um, today, for the purposes of this webinar, I am sort of acting as a proxy, um, standing in as a member of at large on behalf of the Keystone Votes Coalition, uh, which is a nonpartisan coalition comprising of about uh, 40 organizations or so that have been working for years, really, um, to update Pennsylvania's election laws. Um, Keystone Votes represents the interest of voters um, across the Commonwealth and their experiences, um, especially in relation to the decisions that are made by our elected officials and our elections officers. Um, and I will say that the membership base is uh, very much excited and encouraged by the, um, the momentum and the attention that these issues have, have gained, um, especially so early in this legislative session, right? Um, and sorry, I will be remiss if I didn't pause here and express my sincere gratitude and appreciation to Trevor Palmer uh, for his leadership and his unbridled enthusiasm to create spaces and conversations that can hopefully, you know, lead us to ensuring that the best forms 
of these bills that he is pushing forward uh, really become a reality. Uh, with the ultimate goal, obviously, of bringing more eligible voters into this process. Uh, I think that his work on, the, on these issues is very critical. It is very timely. And it really represents a huge step forward for this Commonwealth and for the people that we represent. Um, so to kind of get to your, your question, Steve, I want to potentially, if I can, um, set my following comments into this framework of good governance and pragmatic policy making. Um, we know that voters all across every political spectrum um, really do have desires for modernizing our election systems. Um, however, uh, they are extremely sensitive, right, to uh, elected officials making these changes for political gains. Um, thus, we want to make sure uh, throughout this process, no matter which way that it goes, what gets passed, what doesn't get passed, um, that things are done with transparency, right, and that they are done, as Senator Fulmer said, in a bipartisan fashion and manner. Um, because we know from, you know, public opinion polling, from research, and pretty much common sense will tell you that, you know, any attempt to make reforms to our election system partisan is going to be problematic. So two kind of specific things that I want to highlight first up, um, in this package of bills that we are kind of getting some word, and I'm not sure how uh, affirmative this is, but somewhere that there is some growing appetite um, to bring some of these bills to the Senate um, State Government Committee for a vote in the near future. Um, around no excuse absentee, as I mentioned, um, as well as some of the technical procedures for absentee valid deadline submissions. Um, so I would say with respect to Senate Bill 411, which I believe is the one dealing with no excuse absentee eligibility, uh, which by the way, um, just for the sake of argument, um, but not necessarily meant to belabor the point at nauseum too much, but getting into the semantics of the way that we message this endeavor, uh, when we talk about true no excuse absentee measures, uh, we're kind of really talking about optional vote by mail, uh, which is believed as a more digestible and relatable sort of lexicon and phrasing to use, um, as no excuse absentee voting can sometimes be confusing to the general public when they hear the word uh, absentee voting, they still kind of associate the need to physically be absent um, uh, on election day in order to participate in the process. And that's not necessarily the intention of, of this uh, reform package. So, you know, in order to encourage the most participation in this process, you know, if approved going forward, we really should give some consideration to shifting the paradigm on how we are messaging um, to optional vote by mail versus no excuse absentee voting. Uh, it is really a direction that many other states who have adopted um, this have gone as a best practice for messaging and for branding. But you know, nonetheless, uh, I think when, when this measure was first uh, unveiled, I, I want to say sometime in the early part of this year, I think around January, um, the stated goal was to eliminate the burdensome restrictions that are currently in place around absentee ballots. Um, and Keystone Votes, the coalition, wholeheartedly agrees with this in concept, right? Um, in fact, you know, making the use of absentee ballots less restrictive um, so more eligible voters could vote early and vote by mail has always been a major kind of platform of the coalition since its inception. And, you know, honestly, quite frankly, there in 2019, in the 21st century, there really shouldn't be any reason why every voter should have to vote on one specific day. Um, optional vote by mail, the way we kind of look at it, gives residents a more convenient way um, to participate in our democracy, um, especially the increasing number of individuals um, like myself and probably many of you who are on this call who work long hours and untraditional work hours. Um, voting by mail without an excuse also, it, um, it protects access to our democracy for people with disabilities, people who have certain religious beliefs, um, for our senior citizens, um, without putting any unnecessary hurdles or invading on their privacy. And a big point of this, really, it can make election day a lot easier for counties as well, right? So the more people who vote by mail um, means and vote early means that there's going to be fewer people who are actually voting in person, which can result in shorter lines on election day and can reduce a lot of the burdens on elections officials, as well as some of the burdens that we see 
um, are being placed on our poll workers. As Senator Fulmer mentioned, there's already a shortage of being able to recruit and retain poll workers, let alone the sort of the burdens that they have to, do, to deal with when there are long lines. Um, I think the last time that I, I read and I, I checked, um, Pennsylvania is, I believe, one of about 19 states where an excuse currently is still required for absentee balloting. Uh, while 28 other states, as well as D.C., I believe, currently permit any qualified voter to vote absentee without offering an excuse. And I think additionally, there are eight states plus D.C. which offer uh, permanent absentee ballot lists, which essentially means that any voter um, can ask to opt in to being added to this list, and they will automatically receive an absentee ballot for all future elections until they either move out of the state or they choose to opt out. So we kind of see this as the simplest solution to some of these challenges really is to modify the existing statute um, to broaden the scope of absentee voting to give all voters um, the option to vote by mail. Now, I, I, know that, um, I know that there is a lot of discourse going on right now, probably in the Senate as well as in the House uh, with respect to whether we move you know, a bill like this forward through statute, through the traditional process, or do it through constitutional amendment. Um, and I really commend Senator Fulmer, um, you know, and, and his team for, you know, if they're willing to give some consideration to possibly push both routes uh, forward and see kind of where the consensus falls and where the chips fall. Um, certainly, I personally know that it would be a fool's errand for me to get into a constitutional scholarly debate with Senator Fulmer. So I don't want to do that. But I do want to um, express that we are not opposed to doing it constitutionally. Um, but our preference is to go about it through statute. And we do believe there is some precedent and some legal um, backing for us to go through it that way. Um, you know, there really is a sense of urgency from the coalition and those that we represent um, to get this done and in place for the 2020 election. And we know if we have to do it through a constitutional amendment, um, that the earliest that it can actually pro probably get done if it goes perfectly is the fall of 2021. So we'll miss that 2020 deadline. Um, again, the ultimate win for Pennsylvania voters is that this gets done with, um, either way, um, one way or another, but that it gets done correctly. And I do want to, uh, uh, Steve, flag um, some lessons learned from our, our neighbors to the west of us in Ohio, um, who back in, I want to say it was around, I think around 2005, 2006, around that time, they were pretty much in the same state that we are right now, trying to figure out what to do with what they called at the time, uh, no fault absentee um, voting, right? And so they have since passed it, I want to say in 2006, um, no fault absentee voting, and from my conversation with some advocates there, they've seen early voting in that state go up between 30 and 40 percent since that time, um, which has had major sort of impacts on decreasing the amount of long lines, right? Because less people are you know, needing to show up to vote in person on election day, uh, as well as advocates in Ohio have noted that, you know, if they had this magical time machine and they could go back in time in 2005 and sort of do this vote by mail all over again. Um, they will push to make it a requirement that the Secretary of State be responsible for mailing out absentee ballot applications to every voter before an election. Um, the benefits of that is you educate the voters, because um, a part of this is, you know, it takes time for voters to know that there's a new process in place. You mail out the ballots, you get to educate and inform all the voters um, that this new option now exists, as well as it's a good way to increase participation in this new process straight out the gate. Um, another recommendation that they had is um, to make absentee ballot the application process um, to be able to be submitted online, right? So currently now in Pennsylvania, if you want absentee ballot, you have to print it out, fill it out, and mail it into the county elections office, and then they mail it back to you, right? So they're thinking about how can they have that whole process be online. You can download it, you can fill it out online, and you can send it to your county elections office without um, having to mail it in, which saves costs, right? It's cost efficient because um, it saves you on postage for the voter as well as for the county. And it minimizes opportunities for applications to get, to get lost in the mail. So the fi final recommendation um, that they kind of push forward is, because I don't want to forget 
um, you know, it's for the the ballot return envelope. So when you actually fill out your application, you get your ballot in the return envelope as well. That if they could do it again, for prepaid postage um, to be on those return envelopes to eliminate confusion. Some of the things that they saw that people would put one stamp on their ballot and send it out and that ballot would get sent back to them because it wasn't weighted properly. And so they were supposed to actually put two stamps on it. But if you pre prepay for postage, you kind of um, deal with some of those issues. So th those are some recommendations that we, you know, we really want to, you know, highlight from our neighbors over to the West. And, and like I said, we are really looking forward to and hoping that Senator Fulmer and his staff and other senators are willing to just continue this conversation with coalition members and, you know, receive some of the input. So I'll pause there because I know I'm way over my time. I'm sorry. All right. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Arianne. So Senator Fulmer, um, I'm hearing from you and from Arianne basically four areas um, that, the that the legislative package is kind of uh, focused on. And the first one we heard a lot about so far is the no excuse absentee voting. Um, but there's also some that are focused on the deadlines of when these mail ballots have to get, uh, have to arrive at the polls and the last time they can be postmarked. Um, so I wanna, I wanna ask you a couple questions about those, but then also um, find out more about these vote centers um, that's in, in another piece of legislation that I think at the hearing seemed to be confusing to some of the members of the committee. Um, and then I, I want to also have you touch on open primaries, because I think that's uh, an idea that the business community uh, has shown a lot of support for. Um, and, and we certainly support that in, in Business for America. But let me ask you first, um, Senator Fulmer, a lot of the testimony at, at the hearing and, and Arianne's comments today were talking about really moving the no excuse absentee voting to a complete um, option to vote by mail. Um, and, you know, just full stop, you can vote by mail or you can show up on election day, or maybe what we'll talk about in a little bit, you could show up at some voter center somewhere else. How are you thinking about um, really adopting um, a vote by mail option for Pennsylvania and, um, and 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 do you do you feel that your colleagues on the committee are are also uh, with you on that? Well, to answer that, we're first of all, with all this, this is a long journey, and with every long journey begins with the first step. So what we're trying to do with the absentee ballot scenario is move towards that voting by mail, um, and and that would probably be the best way I can explain it because right now I don't think I have the consensus for that to get it done. And because in Pennsylvania, in order to get any bill done, to get any policy move forward, you need these three magic numbers, 26, 102, and one. Uh, I need 26 other senators to go along with the packages to get it out of the Senate. I need 102 House members to, to get it, uh, to the governor's desk and of course I need the governor to sign it because if he doesn't then it gets vetoed and we gotta start over again with a super majority. So the goal here is I do get what what the Arian's saying. I certainly do. And um, and and this is we're trying to take that step and and and, and to move forward here. Uh, again, we're open to all the discussions going forward. I'm very serious about this. Uh, and such. This is from Patricia Rooney, I believe. She brought up a very good question about poll workers. Uh, Ms. Rooney, I want to assure you that no elected official would be able to, to work the poll. Her concern was, uh, and from her community, it's a smaller community, and, the, and she was afraid that uh, political operatives would be working on, on for people that they're trying to vote against. Now, this is just people that work in government. They may have a, 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 a nominal job that because of the way in Pennsylvania it's written that if you have any government job whatsoever, you wouldn't be able to be a poll worker. We wanted to loosen that up, but no elected official would be doing that. That's the answer to that question for Ms. Rooney. So I, I hear you saying that, that you, it's a long haul and, um, and the first part of this journey is, is to get rid of some of the uh, rules around um, needing an excuse for absentee voting. But since you're taking the, the perspective that we have to do this with a constitutional amendment, so given that's a very um, 
laborious and, and time consuming process if we are, um, is, is it your intent to make that constitutional amendment worded in such a way that we would be able to do vote by mail by statute? Or do you think we would need two sets of constitutional amendments, one for the, for the first stage and then on a whole nother one to make it vote by mail? The, the goal on my absentee ballot the constitutional amendment, and, and by the way, I wanna address uh, Arian's concerns and, and he brings up good concerns. Uh, constitutional amendment takes time and process. And, and, and some of this should be done sooner than later. I get all that. And we're going to do it both ways, by the way. Uh, the, we're, we're starting out with the Constitutional Amendment because we want to start that process. Uh, we're trying to make the Constitutional Amendment be written such a way that it would be open to, what, what, to get to that, a, a, that eventual voting by mail scenario. Now, there will be a, other legislation going forward as far as uh, without having to have a Constitutional Amendment on, on, on uh, absentee balloting and, and, and so forth and, and possible voting by mail. But again, I just wanna let you know, voting by mail right now is as we've been taking the uh, litmus test, you could say, uh, I just don't have that consensus yet going forward. And, and we, I'm really working hard to reach out across the aisle to get this consensus to the best of our ability. I, I do want to ask you, Senator Fulmer, um, to talk about the business aspects of, of, of these kind of election reforms. It, it, it seems, um, you know, very clear to, to us and our organization that um, bolstering and strengthening our election system and, and our voter participation is, is a great um, boost to our economy and to, and to the public spiritedness that, that really helps all, our, all of our governments um, at, at every level operate with, with um, the most uh, accountability and efficiency and, and the highest, you know, the higher voter satisfaction is the customer satisfaction of, of, of citizens. But we're talking about the ability to, to, to vote by mail, more people could do that. That would mean, wouldn't it, that, that people wouldn't have to miss work or wouldn't have to have um, stress with certain shifts when they're so, so that they need to you know leave the job that's important for them to do in order to get to the polling place in time or to juggle their childcare or whatever, it seems to be to, to us that there's a lot of really positives for the business community in this kind of legislation. Well, there's no doubt, and we, we really are trying to get there. And I'm I'm not just saying that as a fact. Uh, if I may back up just a little bit, the reason sure. why I'm, I'm pushing for the constitutional amendments is this that in Pennsylvania, Article One, Section Two of our state constitution basically gives all Pennsylvanians uh, the inalienable and indefeasible right to alter, reform, or change their government as they see proper. And we really don't have any uh, initiative type of balloting uh, except for constitutional amendments and, and and such. So the goal here was on on these very important issues that affect all voters uh, to give them an option to say yay or nay. On, on any of these things, number one. So, so that we are always keeping the we the people uh, mm -hmm. in mind as, as we're moving forward. Now, pushing forward to, to, the, to the business impact, you're, you're so right. Um, uh, again, our goal is to, to working towards those, those arenas, but believe it or not, as I told you before, uh, to, we gotta overcome some of the, um, what's the term I'm looking for, uh, cynicism or possible conspiracies of, you know, oh, this is just uh, the left trying to do something or this is just something the right's trying to do. Our goal here is no, we're just trying to make it, make the, our voting system more accessible, easier, secure, so that every voter has that opportunity to exercise their inalienable and constitutional right to vote. Which is something that we're so enthusiastically, you know, happy about that that um, that you are spearheading that kind of a of an approach to the to this situation, which I think has been so important to to marshal that kind of bipartisan um, thinking around how do we how do we improve this? It's not a Republican, Democrat, left, right kind of thing. Um, talk to us about these vote centers. Um, there was a lot of 
questions, even from your, your, your minority chair um, at the hearing, are what is the idea behind it? And, and do you see them connected to the, to the other idea in, the legisl in another piece of legislation, which is to uh, eliminate some polling places in very rural areas where there's not very many voters and very few people to work the polls? Um, how, how do you see this kind of like new vision for voting and uh, with voting centers? Well, the goal was to, we were hearing from the judges of elections that it's getting harder to find places to vote. Uh, schools don't like to have them uh, uh, open anymore to the schools, especially when the schools are open um, because of security reasons and so forth. Um, uh, and, and we seem to have, if, I'm, if I know this correctly, we seem to have a, a consensus problem as far as the consolidating of the, of, of, of the polling. There are some concerns about the consolidation of, of, of the voting places. The idea behind the voting center was no matter where you were driving from, if you're driving from the southern part of the county coming into your home and you, there was a voting center, you could go in and vote, right? To me, that just made sense. Your name's you're, you're a registered voter, you would pop up and, and uh, baba boom, baba bang, you voted. Uh, but we've, we, we found out that there's, there's some issues that we need to work on, on on the consensus aspect of that. So let me just turn quickly to Arion. Um, voter centers, this is something that has been done in other states, right? Um, to talk to us a little bit about what, what that meant in other, in other states when this has been tried. Yeah, that it, it has. So, so uh, we would not be um, sort of being the standard bearer for doing uh, vote centers. Um, I think, you know, conceptually, the idea of vote centers is designed to expand access to the ballot. Um, and it, you know, helps as Senator Fulmer says, if you are, um, you know, living in, in a certain area, but you work downtown, um, and it's convenient for you to just be downtown. You can go right into that place and, and vote, to, and you don't have to necessarily be at your home polling location. I think that, you know, with any conversation that I've had with other states that have vote centers, I think that the really thing to focus on is realizing that the devil's in the details on how we write this legislation and policy, um, because implementation, uh, sometimes the way that counties may interpret the, the legislation may be different and it's you know hard to get some uniformity around that, especially I think in Pennsylvania because we have this sort of um, you know a lot of counties feel like there's like the state's rights kind of uh, sort of feeling. And so they kind of interpret certain things a little bit differently and it's not always uniform. So I think the devil's in the details on how we think about doing these vote centers and specifically when it comes to implementation, um, thinking about where these vote centers are actually going to be located. Right, so for for areas you're putting in a certain area, you might not have disparate impact. If you're closing down phone locations, you might have disparate impact on communities of color, people with disabilities, seniors who may have accessibility issues. Right, and understanding that not everybody has a car to drive. Right, some people take public transportation, and they have to take two or three buses maybe to get to a voting center. Like, what impact is that going to have on their quality of life? Right. Also, you know, what unintended consequences of where we put these voting centers have on our actual voters, where if I have to catch two or three buses just to get to the voting center, because my polling location is now closed, it's a financial burden that's being put on voters um, to be able to have the opportunity to vote. So it's just a lot of things that, you know, other states have been sort of dealing with and trying to figure out and sort of troubleshoot that, you know, you know, places like, um, uh, Maricopa County in Arizona, they have some election officials that are happy to continue to have like conversations with us, give us some of their feedback on their experiences. But there's a lot of things that you really have to take into consideration. It's not um, as simple as we're just going to do vote centers, but we have to realize like how is that actually is impacting on like experiences for our actual voters. Um, I have another one for Senator Fulmer. So, um, Senator. Uh, in a couple of the testimonies, uh, including from our coalition uh, leader, Ray Murphy, um, uh, the, the witnesses um, 
and actually Senator w uh, Williams, I guess, mentioned this too, um, that a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the difference between whether this is going to go well or not go well is if the resources are there for the county election officials. You know, if, if there's the training, there's the money to train, if there's, if there's the, the resources for, for them to, to get it right. And, and I think um, Arian can tell us a couple stories of some other states that rolled out some very, very good uh, reforms, very well-meaning, but, but didn't put enough uh, money in the bank, so to speak, for the election people so that uh, it created um, unintended consequences. Um, what is the current state of the funding um, issues in, in the Senate? Um, as, as you close in on a budget for this coming fiscal year, um, there's been a tussle around the money um, for these new voting machines for the counties. And is this and I, and, and I think that your committee is so, it, 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 uh, like you said, you started talking to these election officials they never got talked to before. So they, so, so they know how, how much in the corner you are for them. But um, are you optimistic that the legislature will be able to put together a budget that will have um, enough money so that they can do, the, do it the right way? Well, listen, I'm, I've been sitting here talking about bipartisan and consensus, but, and, and this is not to be critical of the administration, but they really did, I just don't think they did a very good job in putting together a plan. Um, we, they settled the law, the Stein's lawsuit, and, and, and assumed that, that the legislature was just going to do this. Um, Going back to the machines, I can guarantee you there's not one elected official that I know of or county commissioner and or judges of election that doesn't know that we need to replace our machines. The question was, has always been the timing and who was going to pay for it and, and, and how were we going to come up with those monies? Uh, I believe that I think on the positive note that, I mean, as we move forward down the road, whether we replace all the machines by 2020 or not, that I believe is going to be a challenge. And, and the challenge is, isn't again, not because we don't need more new machines, the challenge is gonna be uh, potential problems of operating those new machines in a very contentious and, and a very volatile uh, election cycle that 2020 is going to be. And, and if we have any holdups or if there's any problems, who's gonna take the blame for it? And who's, who, who's gonna be the ones to be held responsible for it? And, and, and such, number one. And if we don't have an answer in Pennsylvania of who won uh, by the next day, people are gonna then start, the conspiracies are gonna be out. You know, this election was stolen and or whatever. So the goal here was, that's why we've been asking all the questions because the goal here is yes, to come up with the funding, number one. Number two is coming up with a safe time frame to initiate these new machines. I b believe if we're gonna be having a hearing with uh, uh, Kathy Bookvar next week, who's gonna be the uh, nominee, she's a nominee, a nominee for the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we just got, there was a newspaper article in the Philadelphia Inquirer on, on Montgomery County and their new machines that they used in, a, in the 15, in the 29, in, in this recent election. There was about 15, 17% turnout. And a lot of the comments, if you read in the comments, were not favorable. Uh, there was problems and they weren't happy with this. Now imagine, push forward, imagine rather than, than a very low turnout local election scenario, plug that into a 2020 high volume turnout election where, where, where tempers are gonna be, emotions are gonna be high, tempers could be even higher. And if there's any type of problems, there's, we, we, need, we just need to be really careful. But again, to, I probably gave you a long answer for a very short question. My point is, is that our goal is to look for the monies. Our goal is to do our responsible thing. We do know that we do need new machines down the road and as, as we move forward, but let's do it in a safe way that, because the goal of all these things that we're talking about and, 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 and Arian and so forth from the local business folks and the business folks themselves is number one, making sure that our elections are secure, making sure that they're safe, 
making sure that there's e easier accessibility and making sure that everybody who's, who, who has the constitutional right to, to vote gets that chance to do so and that their vote counted. Well, you're very right, Senator Fulmer, that there's all like there's always blame to be cast everywhere around. Am I am I on here? Yeah. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so if if uh, if 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 you put uh, put together um, the the package and the and the and the funding, um, then and something goes wrong, uh, maybe maybe some people will say, oh, you should blame the governor, or they'll say, no, you should blame the legislature. So it's there's there's always. Um, uh, yeah, a failure is is like is an orphan, right? No, nobody nobody wants to claim uh, the problems with it. But Arian, um, can you can you share with us some um, some maybe uh, uh, point like pointers for in other experiences in other states who have done some of these reforms, and um, and 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 uh, I, I assume that sometimes it, it came out well, and, and sometimes they had some challenges. What what can we learn from that? Sure, that's that's certainly to, to be expected. Um, there's always going to be lessons learned um, in the process, and you know, um, you know. I think Senator Fulmer mentioned talking about perfection earlier. I, I do agree that um, perfection sometimes is the enemy of progress, um, and so sometimes you have to kind of troubleshoot some things. We definitely learn some lessons from other states. I, I kind of want to steal a, a quick quote from you, though, Steve, in our earlier call. I think of the other week in terms of the funding is that we don't want a Groupon deal when it comes to our elections. I, we, we want to make sure we put the, the necessary resources behind this to make it work efficiently for everyone. Um, but I, I think beyond just the conversation around the voting machines, the physical machines, you also, also have to consider the, the other costs that are associated with it, right? So the cost of the software that's needed to run these machines, uh, pushing to improve uh, the security and the quality of our electronic voter file. So that it can be more accurately reflective um, of who is eligible to vote in real time, as well as allocating resources specifically for things like educating voters about the new system that they'll be using, many of them for the first time. Um, and he mentioned Senator Fulmer to Montgomery County. Um, it definitely is something we can allocate some resources for retraining every single poll worker um, across the state so that they know how to use and troubleshoot some of the machines to make sure our um, our election day voting is as efficient as possible. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, Keystone Votes has supported um, the County Commissioners Association of EAs and the election director's request for the $125 million that we believe is really going to take funding to replace some of our aging and insecure voting systems and all the other items that are associated with voting. We've been doing that from the start, from things like, you know, moving the entire state to electronic poll vote uses. Um, so, there, so just want to kind of flag you know, for Pennsylvania, as we're thinking about this, how other states have, you know, thought about it's more than just the physical, the conversation should be more than just the physical machines. That's part of, that's like a piece of the puzzle, but there are other aspects to it, like training and voter education and software that also need to be packaged in thinking about how we allocate the funds for this as well. Um, thanks, Ariane. So we have another question from the very inquisitive Patricia Rooney, who's now submitted her second question. Thank you, Patricia. Um, so Senator Fulmer, um, she, she, she says in her question that um, you said there wasn't a consensus uh, for vote by mail um, right now in the committee, or maybe you're speaking generally in, the, in, the, in your chamber in the Senate, but you didn't share what the objections are to going to all vote by mail. So she wants to know um, what are the objections um, so that she can um, get a, a better idea of what she, what she wants to support or not. Well, and that's another great question. And it's not, remember, this isn't about being totally against voting by mail. The objections are more questions. For instance, what will be the process? Uh, the devil will be in the details as, as we move forward with it. Uh, what will be the rules, uh, the deadlines, the procedures? A lot of concerns have been with the postmarks of, of, of the voting by mail. And then how will the votes be verified? These are some of the, the questions that are, that are bringing up, well, they're not ready quite yet to vote for a vote by mail scenario. So these are the questions that we're trying to work through as we move forward. And in a sense, if you have a, a really good no excuse absentee voting scenario, 
that's almost like voting by mail if, 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 and it's also voting early. So, I mean, it's, we're, we're, we're kind of like in Pennsylvania Dutch country call killing two birds with one stone here, um, scenario here as, as we move forward. So our goal here is to, to look, to work through those things, but that was a great question. Um, so let me um, ask the, the last uh, a question on the last um, area that, that I had mentioned earlier, which is the open primaries. Um, that seemed to be a very entertaining portion of the hearing with TJ Rooney and Alan Novak, and, um, and, and they both were, were sharing how when they were chairs of the respective parties, they would have been talking to you about, about a different perspective, but now they're, they're really pioneering a, a bipartisan coalition together. Um, it seemed like something that you were pretty passionate about too, Senator Fulmer. So are you, are you a, a strong proponent of the open primary and, and um, which I think you are. And if you are, how do you, um, how do you think about what um, Secretary um, Bookvar said was one of the issues with the legislation that it seemed to open up the primaries to independents who were not affiliated but it didn't, um, it, it didn't allow people who are registered for some minor party or political body or some crazy thing they put down at the motor vehicle department. They're allowed to just put down anything, like they said, the keg party or the, or the birthday party. So, um, uh, so talk to us about how you're thinking about open primaries these days. Well, I, I think on that particular portion of, of the committee, I started out very skeptical of, of open primaries, uh, bought into the old concerns about, you know, elections will be manipulated and, and they'll be, you know, they'll, they'll try to either Republicans will try to dominate what the Democrats are trying to do or the Democrats will try to dominate what the Republicans are going to do. I just reduced it to this. And then I'll get to the other portion of your question. Republican and Democrat primaries are funded by taxpayers. And if you're an independent taxpayer, you're not allowed to vote in something that you're helping to fund. Now, this may sound corny, it may sound crazy, but to me, that is number one, a good example of taxation without representation, number one. Now, how do we get there? Again, I think the devil will be in the details. Uh, who's gonna be included to be able to do so? You're right the keg party, the birthday party, and so forth. Um, the, but the bottom line is, I think we need to look at it seriously. I'm, I'm in favor of moving forward and, and, and getting this discussion to, 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 to a final step. I think we could do it. And I think there's a way, there's enough smart people on both sides of the aisle to, to get it and do it right. I just think it needs to be done. I, I actually, I'm be honest with you, I'm surprised there hasn't been a lawsuit uh, going forward. Now I know they can say, well, if you want to vote, you can, you can join one of the parties. You can, you can become a Democrat for a period of time, or you become a Republican for a period of time, then you can change back again. Why should you have to go through all that? Maybe you don't want to be a Democrat. Maybe you don't want to be a Republican. So why would I want to even irritate your liberty of conscience or violate your liberty of conscience? If you want to be an independent, you have a right to do so. But as long as we're, if the Republicans and Democrats want to keep this closed, well, then they got to stop taking public dollars to running their primaries. And, and your legislation to do the open primaries, you're not, it's not, you're not going to allow a Republican to vote in the Democratic primary or a Democrat to vote in the Republicans, right? Just, just, correct. Correct. This is, this is allow independence and, and whoever else, how we, how we work that out. However we can work, but I think we could work it out. This is common sense. And I think what we'll do is, and I, I, I think it will, it will bring forth better candidates. I think it will bring forth uh, more excitement in, 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 in voting. And, and we shouldn't be afraid of allowing the people to have their say. We just shouldn't be. Senator Fulmer, I think just saying the words common sense and saying that it's coming out of the legislature is very exciting to the business. <laughs> <laughs> and, to, and to voters in general, that if there's like an outgrowth or an outpouring of common sense happening right now in 2019 in, in Harrisburg, then, um, then, then people will be more smiling and, 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 having, and having much happier lives, I think. Well, we're trying our best. And, and, and this was, I, I don't know, I, this was excellent. And I, I really appreciate uh, Ms. Rooney's questions. 
Uh, I'm glad she was listening. I'm glad she asked those questions. That they were they, they needed to be answered. Thank you. So we're about to wrap up. So um, Ariane, um, do you have a, a final word for us? Sure, and I, I will be brief. I know I've been a little long-winded this whole time, but I'll, I'll try to be brief. I want to just thank you again for allowing um, us to be here and to participate in this webinar. Um, I just encourage all of those who are on this call today to, you know, to just kind of stay informed, stay educated, stay, you know, aware um, and abreast of all the situations that are going on, the policies that are out there, um, and stay connected um, and, and figure out how you can be advocates for yourself and for your community and for those and for your loved ones. Um, I, you know, welcome uh, opportunities um, for the coalition if, if Senator Fulmer would welcome it. You know, to continue to have, give, give input to the bills going forward. We'd love to be part of this process, um, you know, over the next couple of weeks and, and months and years to get Pennsylvania to where we really want it to be, where we can create access and expand opportunities to voting for all Pennsylvanians. So, thank you. I, I want to extend, um, thank you, Ariane. Thank you, Senator Fulmer. I extend um, Business for America's deep gratitude to, to both of you for joining us in this webinar and educating our uh, members and supporters about the um, out, outbreak of, of um, common sense that is happening in the legislature that, that could um, really improve um, all, of, all of elections <laughs> in Pennsylvania and augur uh, an era of, of, of bipartisan uh, coming together to solve problems, which is something that the business community um, feels that you can never do enough of that. Um, if, if, you were, if it was 24 seven, we would still say maybe we could get a little more common sense somewhere to, to get something done. So thank you so much. And, and we look forward to working closely with you in the future, Senator Fulmer. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here. And uh, my ears are open. I, I have eyes I want to see. I, I just wanted to see what I need to see, not just what I want to see. And, and the goal here is to bring real meaningful reform here in a, in a bipartisan consensus fashion to show that we can build bridges and we can communicate and we can get good stuff done. 